E.T. is out there. Uh, there just has to be in that uh, 100 million star system, uh, galaxy that we belong, we, we part of, and we dwell in, uh, other cases of life originating, because we now know there are so many planets, uh, that uh, cer almost certainly you're going to have certain, some of the planets uh, that are um, Goldilocks, uh, that is the right position at next nearest their sun, the right size, uh, and so on, that uh, can have the potential to create life. And of those, it seems, and we don't have any basis for this except intuition, that given enough millions of years, in our case we had half a billion years uh, since life came on the land uh, to um, produce a uh, human-grade eusocial species. And um, so we can only guess that it's likely that that has occurred in some of them. So here's what I did. Um, in the course of this book, actually, it, I, um, I did it with some care, uh, the, um, the meaning of human existence. Um, I looked over uh, the many uh, examples of the origin of whole new lines of animals that have occurred on the land uh, since the early Paleozoic. Now we're talking going back more than 450 million years. It's a long time. Uh, the land of Earth was populated by the first plants, then forest, and with them a uh, whole array of, of animal types. So we have these many, multi many multiple lines of animals that originated. And here, uh, and, and we can, I think, reasonably uh, conclude that youth sociality, when it did develop, including big animals that have the capacity to create a big brain cerebrum, uh, memory storage area is essentially what it is, and this bizarre round head shape that we have, I mean, seen from the point of view of a gorilla. We have a bizarre, funny-looking head. Um, that um, here is what um, they all have in common. Now I'm talking empirical information. First, have to be on the land. Can't develop uh, advanced uh, societies and anything like civ uh, civilization which in humans goes back a couple hundred thousand years. Well, why not? Why no marine freshwater creatures? Because they don't have fire. You just have to have, in order to build tools beyond chipping some rock or stone away, or maybe crude binding of uh, a fascia, fascia of, of materials together, you don't have any way to create more advanced technology without concentrated power source that you can transport from one place to another. E.T., I'm now drawing this again from the record of multiple origins of animal lines on Earth. E.T. Uh, has got a head, and the head's up front, and the head contains a central organizing centers for all of the senses that are spread out through the body. Uh, E.T. has got a small number of limbs, multiple, maybe six, who, who knows, maybe eight, like a, like a spider, uh, but uh, not that many, uh, relatively few. And E.T. Uh, has on these limbs, fingers or, or tentacles, something with strength and flexibility are free. You see, that's what uh, that was a prerequisite that we had when we stepped out of the trees. Our ancestors did five million years, years or so ago. The earliest known Australopith, pre-human, uh, already was walking on hind legs. That was just an adaptation it had. And one of the consequences of freeing the front uh, legs 
is that now you have organs that can be modified to manipulate, but there's more. And that is, you have to have soft, pulpy fingertips. And when you think about it, uh, think about the primates you know, old world and new world. That's a primate trait, soft, pulpy fingertips, because you need those to manipulate finely in, the, in our ancestors' case, and all the primates that are arboreal and so on, you need to be able to manipulate pits of food, you know, like plucking free a piece of fruit, plucking seeds out of a fruit, uh, taking a flower and opening it and eating it and so on. Um, so that's, that's another trait of E.T. And I would admonish script writers for Hollywood films that have space and alien monsters invading Earth, don't give them claws. Uh, claws are for carnivores. And, car and you've got to be an omnivore to be an ET. There just isn't enough energy available in, in the next trophic level down to maintain big populations and stable populations that can evolve civilization. That was a bit of a stretch, but I feel confident about that. Claws, or no, for that's for carnivores. E.T. is big. Not big elephant size adjusted for gravity. You know, if you have a very light of gravity uh, in a small, uh, smaller planet, or uh, uh, you would be um, able to get a gigantic animal that's very mobile uh, for Earth planet Earth size, uh, an elephant is just too big to really get anywhere. A primate is just the right size. This is a sort of the Goldilocks rule for size. So those are some of the traits of E.T. And to that I'll add, uh, in addition to their being omnivore, uh, that uh, they will be, uh, they will have moral instincts. That is, they will be able to be generous to at least some extent, caring uh, and altruistic, not just to individuals of their own species, but to other species. And there's a reason I say that, and that is because almost certainly uh, all of the youth social creatures that produce advanced societies did so through group selection. Group versus group. When you have groups competing with groups and driving, helping drive the social instinct, instincts by the Darwinian superiority of cooperation within the group, uh, then you have the capacity for a moral system within the group and then eventually between groups under certain circumstances but not nearly as strong between groups as it is within groups. Um, that, I think, is a statement of the prevailing theory of the origin of morality in human beings. And I'll close this with a mantra uh, that's useful, and that is as follows. Within a group, selfish individuals beat uh, altruistic individuals, if you have both, you know, genetic propensity. Uh, those who have a genetic propensity toward selfishness uh, versus those that have capacity for altruism and more cooperative behavior within the group, the selfish ones prevail over the altruistic ones. But in competition between groups, which is absolutely intense, in all youth social species, including humans, and that group competition is what defines humans to a large extent. But between groups, the competition uh, is such that out groups of altruists defeat groups of self individuals. So you get a kind of a balance always in human evolution between a tendency to be increasingly altruistic and cooperative cooperative, balanced to some extent by a tendency of individuals in these groups to perform, behave in a 
selfish manner with respect to others. Uh, and we, that's a balance in human beings, and it's unstable. It can never come to some point like a Nash equilibrium and stop. But it means that we're always going, this is, human. This is the nature of humans, uh, that we are eternally, internally, eternally conflicted uh, in our thinking, in our self-examination, in our decisions we're making. And that's a good thing, that it's unstable, uh, that it's a product of these, this great fundamental conflict, because that's a source of human creativity in the creative arts, and competitive behavior among people and between groups uh, that drives a lot of the best salience of uh, the evolution of civilization.